Good morning, OCC and guests. My name is Kelly Ross, and I'm the worship leader here. We're so excited to worship with you today and share this time with you. Why don't we join in worship and open in prayer? Heavenly God, we ask that as we await you, Lord God, in our homes, that you would be with us. Holy Spirit, you say where two or more are gathered, you are there. So we thank you and we praise you and we ask that the words that we speak, sing, and hear, Lord God, are blessed by you and that we would honor you with all that we do. In Jesus' name. Verses 11 and thir through 13. 
As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hello, OCC family. As you can tell, I am not Craig. Um, my name is Gunnar Mock. I am a member here at OCC. Um, 
And this is my first time giving a full length sermon, so I am so thankful that this thing is not on me, okay? Um, I'm so thankful that God is the one that waters, he is the one that grows, he is the one that truly changes. Uh, so I'm not gonna take too much time giving a little intro here, but um, uh, I want to give a really quick story uh, from when I was at Winona State University. I was uh, writing my thesis, and uh, my doctor at the time, Dr. Holmes, said something really, really important that makes me think of this. Um, so anytime a person is writing a thesis for the first time, they think that they will be changing the world, right, with that thesis. They think that everybody's going to care about what they have to say, that it's gonna be the most important thing ever. Well, that is definitely not the case. Um, Dr. Holmes said that it is like spitting into an ocean of literature that is out there. So that is how I am viewing this sermon. I am simply spitting into an ocean, okay, of all the people that have come before me, of what Craig said, what everybody else has said. So with that, I wanna pray, um, pray for the service, and then we're gonna dive right in. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of speaking to your people. Um, I pray that you get me out of the way, Lord, and that you show these people you, that they don't see me, they don't see Gunnar standing up here, but they see Jesus' words um, being proclaimed to his people. Um, I pray for this service, and I pray for all these people watching at home. In your name, amen. Okay, so we are in summer in our Psalms, okay? Uh, today we're gonna be going through Psalm 36. Um, and Pastor Craig has said a ton about the Psalms, okay? I, I don't know how much more I can add to any context that he's already given. Okay, we know that there are five books within the Psalms. Uh, there are various authors, David writing the majority of them, uh, Moses, Asaph, um, and just a bunch of unknown authors. There are also a bunch of different kinds of Psalms. Psalms of lament, prophecy, protection, um, different things like that. And this psalm, Psalm 36 specifically, was written by a younger David. And he calls himself the servant of the Lord, which is only used in one other place in the psalms, Psalm 18. And we know that um, Psalm 18 was written by an older David, so we know that David was a servant from the time he was young to the time he was old, throughout his entire life. So, and in some of David's psalms, we find uh, a prompting for why he wrote them, um, but in all my research and what I looked into, I, I couldn't really see a lot of what prompted David to write this psalm. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have that for you, but we, what we do know is that David is a servant. He was a servant, okay? And servants are truly submissive to their masters. And in this psalm, we see only those that are truly submissive to Christ as Lord will be delighted in him. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app handy, I really encourage you guys um, to open it up and follow along because um, something that a pastor uh, that uh, I had back in Sioux Falls, um, he always said, uh, as we open the Bible, the Bible actually begins to open us. And we'll see that played out through the psalm and some of the main points here. So I'm going to read Psalm 36 for you, uh, reading from the NLT version if you want to follow along. Psalm 36, for the choir director, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. Sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. They have no fear of God at all. In their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. Everything they say is crooked and deceitful. They refuse to act wisely or do good. They lie awake at night hatching sinful plots. Their actions are never good. They make no attempt to turn from evil. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice just like the ocean depths. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your river of delights, for you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. Pour out your unfailing love on those who love you. Give justice to those with honest hearts. Don't let the proud trample me or the wicked push me around. Look, those who do evil have fallen. They are thrown down, never to rise again. We believe that these are the word of God, okay, not just, um, I'm stealing this again from Jonathan, but just ink on a page, 
They're the inspired word of God. Uh, so I have a question for you guys. Do you think of yourself as generally good or generally bad? Okay, so it's a question to ponder as we dive into the Psalm of David, where as you clearly saw, he contrasts the hearts of men and women with the unfailing love of God. Now, if you're like me, you'll find yourself on one or two sides when you listen to or read this psalm. You either really resonate with the first part of the psalm, okay, so we heard all about um, how people are wicked, right? Um, they cannot see how wicked they are. Uh, they're crooked, they're deceitful, um, they're sinful, all these things. You, you'll really hear that and you'll say, yes, that's what people are like, that's how they are. Or you'll identify mainly with the second part, okay, that God will protect me no matter what I do, okay? Um, he's there no matter what, he'll never fail me now. And both of those things are true, okay? Neither of those things are false. But when we begin to lean to one side, Right? When we begin to only think about um, one side of the equation, uh, we actually begin to shrink the gospel. We begin to shrink the good news that has been given to us. So, and before we dive into the first part of the psalm, I want to make sure um, that we all understand something, that the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us of sin. Okay? Um, I can't just stand up here and say, you guys need to be thinking about your sin more. You need to think about that stuff more. That's not going to do anything for you, okay? We are depraved creatures, all right? We do nothing of our own accord. So going forward, if you haven't uh, been convicted of sin at all or uh, felt a need for forgiveness or repentance, um, maybe you should really talk to somebody about that. There's a chance uh, you may be going down the path of the wicked that we'll see. So um, in summary, Christ does the work. He reveals, okay? We don't do that. Um, but going on, going back to that first question, right, do we think of ourselves generally good or bad, I usually fall into thinking that I'm a pretty good guy, right? Uh, I like to think that I make pretty good decisions, I'm, I'm tolerant, I, go, I do good deeds. Um, you know, the things that I, the, the sins that I have, they're not so bad. Um, but it, the question begs itself, if I'm so good, right, if I'm so good, if I do all these great things, then, then why would I need the unfailing love? and the faithfulness that reaches beyond the clouds that David speaks of in his contrast to the wickedness of man. So before we dive too far into those thoughts, let's break down this psalm a little bit more, okay? So we're going to go through verses 1 through 4. So all you kind of type A people out there that need a roadmap of where we're going, all right, we got three sections here, and you guys might have kind of picked them out. So verses 1 through 4, verses 5 through 9, and verses 10 through 12. we got three sections here, three distinct, distinct sections that we see, Okay? So in verses 1 through 4, uh, reveal a snapshot of the fallen human heart apart from God's grace in Christ Jesus. So let's look at verses 1 and 2. Sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. They have no fear of God at all. In their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. And these verses are so important, okay, because they're really easy to skim over. Okay, and that's how I feel, and quite honestly, that's how I feel with a lot of psalms. Like, I'll, I'll read that, I'll read the entire thing through, and I'll be like, man, that was great. And then I read it two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more times, and I'm like, I didn't even recognize that, okay? So we really don't want to uh, just glaze over this. Um, so the first thing we see here is that sin begins in the heart, which actually makes sense, because if we go back to Jeremiah 17.9, uh, we know and we see that the heart is deceitful above all else, okay? And next we see that for the wicked, they hold no fear of God. And, and you might ask yourself, well, why do I have to be afraid? Why do I have to fear God? Why do I have to have that? Well, we see, we go back to scripture, we see in Proverbs 9.10 that fear of God is where we receive true wisdom from. And if, you, if we go down just a little bit more, getting ahead of myself, okay, but it says that they, uh, they refuse to act wisely or do good, referring to the wicked. So they're not wise because they don't have fear of the God. The sin begins in the heart. So going to verse 2, um, you might read this and go, like, well, in their blind conceit. Well, I don't even know what conceit is. Okay, well, just putting this in layman's terms, um, it, it's actually, it demonstrates something that is just as true today as it was when the psalm was written, okay? And that is that wicked people are blind to their own sin. Okay, wicked people are blind to their own sin. They, they choose to ignore their sin or choose to write it off as, oh, just like I said earlier, how I think sometimes, not that bad. Sin, it says here, sin whispers. Sin whispers to them. It flatters them. 
okay? Sin makes you think that following through with it is better than what God has to offer. And that actually sounds a lot like the first story in the Bible, right? Okay, they were believe, tricked into believing that what is offered there through sin is better than the person who created it, okay? Stephen J. Cole presents these really good four questions that we can ask ourselves to know whether or not we are being flattered and deceived by sin. So number one, do I fear God before whom all things are open and laid bare, according to Hebrews 14? Two, since God knows the very thoughts and intentions of my heart, am I in the habit of judging my own sin quickly on the thought level? When I read the holy standards of God's word, do I apply them to my own heart, or do I just skim over them and apply them to others? Am I growing to identify and hate my own sins more and more through God's word? And so something interesting, a psalm that Craig went through uh, this last week or a couple weeks ago um, actually shows David praying about these specific things, okay, about these sins that lurk in our hearts that we have been deceived by and unaware of. Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13 say, How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. So we can see that even David, a man after God's own heart, he prayed. He prayed about these sins, okay? These hidden faults, these things that he was unaware of because sin whispers, sin blinds, okay? It lies to you. Okay, and we can model this. We can pray specifically about this sin that we're unaware of and, and deceived by or something, or, or we can even ask somebody, ask a person close to you, a fellow Christian. Think about these questions. Going ahead in verses 3 and 4, reading those again. Everything they say is crooked and deceitful. They refuse to act wisely and do good. They lie awake at night, hatching sinful plots. Their actions are never good. They make no attempt to turn from evil. Again, like we kind of see these passages, all right? We, we look at them. We, we, we don't apply them. We, we see that, oh, man, yeah, it's not me. It's me. I don't do any of those things, okay? Like, let's get to the next part. Let's get to the second half, okay? But like David did in Psalm 19, he prayed to God to reveal those things to him, okay? He prayed that God would help him to look inward and introspectively to have a greater view of his own sin, it starts in the heart. We see that in verse 1. And we talk about that a lot, right? It starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. It starts with our heart posture. We've talked about that so much, and it shows it right here. Okay? But then, actually, with sin, it moves towards deliberate sin. And um, this is kind of t a tough subject, but we, we all have um, secret sin in our lives, uh, whether we actively think about it or not. Um, it's, it's something that, it's again, it lies to us. It, it says it's not that bad. It's something that I can keep doing. Uh, Romans 1, 24 through 25 uh, shows us that our natural bent outside of Christ is towards creation over the creator, okay? So Romans 1, 24 through 25. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Um, I was listening to a, a podcast uh, about obedience just to kind of get a, a, a thought on it from other perspectives. And, and Matt Chandler said this about um, our... Uh, our natural bent, okay? And then Craig's talked about this a little bit, our natural bent towards sin. And Matt Chandler says, in fact, the banner over every human being outside of the gospel is, what about me? What about what I want? What about what I deserve? What about me? In fact, some of you even choose your church under that banner. What about what I want? What about what I need? What about what I deserve? This mine, mine, mine is what makes you so miserable. And it's also what probably makes you wicked. And so just, just like what David shows us, we will trade the truth about God, the truth about freedom, for the lie that, the sin, that sin and the devil tells us. True freedom is found in submission to Christ and his will. Okay? And, and that's a tough pill to swallow sometimes, but um, to further illustrate the sinfulness of our hearts, we can go to Romans 3 
where Paul actually quotes, he quotes this psalm in Romans 3, 9 through 18. You'll see it here. So uh, Romans 3, 9 through 18. Well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drops from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. And here it is. They have no fear of God at all. So Paul, one of the greatest missionaries we've ever known, demonstrates here that humanity in its present sinful condition is unacceptable for God. A growing understanding of our present sinful condition allows us to have a bigger and fuller view of what has been done for us on the cross. And Paul actually spends quite a bit of time proving that all human beings, all human beings are lost and guilty without Christ. Without Christ. And still, you know, we might, we might think, we might read all of what we just read, right? And we might think that um, we're not as bad as some people, right? Well, I don't commit murder. I don't, you know, I don't really talk all that bad. Um, I, don't, I don't do these really bad things I keep hearing about on the news. And, and Jesus puts this idea in the dirt in Luke 13. So in Luke 13, 1 through 5, it goes, About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee, um, as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all of the other people from Galilee? Jesus asked. Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too, unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No. And I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. So as we see here in Luke, Jesus shows us that there's no measure of wickedness. There's no measure. God doesn't look at it like that. He shows that unless we repent, all of us will perish in the same way. Jesus demonstrates that God doesn't have um, a horizontal view of sin, right? If you're looking at a bar graph or something, he doesn't, he doesn't see it as like here, 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 right? He has a vertical view of it, and he regards it as such. Okay, all sin is unacceptable before God. And to conclude this portion of the psalm, we can go to Luke 747. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. This is a big one here, church. Awareness of being a big sinner leads to big love. Awareness of being a little sinner leads to little love. I'm going to say that one more time. Awareness of being a big sinner leads to big love. Awareness of being a little sinner leads to little love. Okay? So we're going to transition into the second part of the psalm. I'm going to reread it really quick just to give us a refresher, and we're going to uh, roll right into it. So verses 5 through 9 here. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the ocean depths. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from your abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your river of delights, for you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. So as we transition into the second part of this, psalm, we see a complete 180, right? You see this straight-up division, all right? And in verse 5, David refers to the Lord's unfailing love as being vast as the heavens. This unfailing love in Hebrew is actually translated as hesed. I don't know if I said that right, but I'm going to say it like that. Hesed. It is usually coupled with faithfulness, as we see in the rest of verse 5, right? Your faithfulness reaches, okay? Okay. And so we can see that this kind of love is loyal or as, you, as seen compared to the heavens. It's immeasurable, inexhaustible, okay? And this is great news for you and me, okay? Because you guys can't out God. We cannot out God. It's immeasurable. It's inexhaustible. What great news. 
So we see here in verse 6, verse 6 has some more language that is worth a deeper look into. The Hebrew word for righteousness actually means a conformity to an ethical or moral standard. Now that, that probably pulls at some strings, especially, especially right now in, in our climate. And the question begs itself then is, who defines your ethical and moral standards? Is it culture? Is it, is it the world? Um, is it your feelings? Is it that snap decision? Who defines those? Um, so you might be on that side, or, or, or are you on the other side of the line and actually find your righteousness in the good works you do? Do you, do you feel like you have a report card here, right? You have a report card, like, I did this, this, and this. Well, God takes that report card, he rips it up and says there was no test. So there, there's two sides you could fall on it, but Paul says it best here in Romans 11.33. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his ways. Okay, and how does that wrap up? Well, we see that God's wisdom and knowledge are so beyond our own understanding that it is impossible for us to understand his decisions and ways. Okay, so we might read a lot of things in the Bible. We might not understand a lot of them or where they come from. Well, he, we just saw here it's impossible for us to understand his decisions and ways. Something might happen in your life that you might not know why, okay? But there, God, God's riches and wisdom and knowledge are so great, okay? We have to trust God to define righteousness and that judgment and justice belongs to him. All we have to do is simply surrender to him. Verses 8 and 9 finish off this portion of the psalm with some language that you might have seen somewhere else in the Bible. So just as David calls God the fountain of living water, Jesus referred to himself in the same way in John 7, verses 37 through 38. And here it is. On the last day, in, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So all things in life run dry, and they end. All things, except Jesus. Except his spirit, okay? Uh, humans are fragile. People pass away. Kids grow up. They leave. Um, and just like David was proclaiming God's never-ending love and faithfulness, Jesus is proclaiming the same thing here. All who have been run dry from putting their hope in, in areas of life, uh, family, friends, uh, money, their job. These things run dry, okay? But we can go to Christ whose spirit never ends, like we just saw. It's immeasurable, it's unfathomable, it does not end. He's also called the light of life in the Gospel of John. In verses one, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, he says, The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. So, in John 9, there's a story of a blind man. And we're all blind, just like him. We're all blind to the beauty and glory of God in our natural state. Okay, God is the only one that can open our eyes to the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ. Okay, we're blind to this in our natural sinful state, this, this wicked state that we find ourselves in, okay? This is how much we need God. Okay, I'm probably running, running late on time, so we're just going to keep going ahead. Okay, so the last section, last section here, um, verses 10 through 12. Pour out your unfailing love on those who love you. Give justice to those with honest hearts. Don't let the proud trample me or the wicked push me around. Look, those who do evil have fallen. They are thrown down, never to rise again. So we see in this final portion of the psalm, this last portion, okay, again, we transition. Um, it's David pleading with God for protection from the wicked. This is a prayer for those in God. We saw that God loves us with a faithfulness that we can't even imagine. He imparts his righteousness upon us, and we can do nothing to separate from him. But as even David demonstrates here, this is something that we need a steady flow of, right? It's something to constantly ask for. You can't just um, ask for it once. We need to seek a pure heart from God. Uh, since we saw in the beginning of this psalm, guys, that all outward sin and wickedness begins in the heart. That's where we need to begin. 
Um, so it, it brings us to the concept of, of being sanctified, right? And, and that's just a Christianese word for um, being made like Christ. Okay, and, and it, it's, it's an entire lifetime. You actually don't even get there in this lifetime. You don't become like Christ fully. First John chapter 3, 2 says, Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. This shows us that we won't be like Jesus until we see him face to face. So we're being made like him, but we aren't him. So in verse 11, David asks for protection from the wicked. Um, and, and, and you might see this, right? Evil people uh, try to bring down those who, who are righteous, who have been given righteousness, okay? Uh, they convict uh, those evil people by, by the way they live, okay? And we'll dive into that a little bit later, but... Um, we see in 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 through 12 that Paul exhorts the church at Thessalonica to be worthy of the calling from Christ through the grace and power of Jesus so that the name of Jesus may be glorified further. This is what it says. So we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all good things your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live and you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so to move on, to summarize these concepts in a really useful graphic, we're going to look at the cross chart. It should be up on the screen there. You can Google this too. You can, you can find it. Um, uh, if, so a lot of you might have seen this as well um, if you've read the Gospel Centered Life, but this chart is just really helpful to show that the more we actually understand the depth of our sin, okay, the depth of our sin, so the growing awareness of uh, my flesh and my sinfulness, that's one part of the cross, um, and then a growing awareness of the holiness of God. We can actually grow the cross in our lives, okay, and growing the cross in our lives gives us a greater understanding of Christ and what has been done for us on the cross, okay? So certain things shrink the cross as well, all right? But if we have a growing awareness of both of these things, we'll actually grow it. So I have two points to leave you with so that we can exercise our faith more effect effectively, see the depth of our own sin, and see God's holiness more on a daily basis. So point number one, we can exercise our faith more effectively and see the depth of our own sin by sitting under God's word daily. So like like I said before, uh, we began the message here. Uh, as you begin to open the Bible, the Bible actually begins to open us, okay? We, we, the, the Holy Spirit uh, convicts us through God's Word, okay? That's where it happens. Um, and this becomes more effective the more we open the Bible and open the Spirit into our lives. To not only change our hearts to it, to make our desires His desires. That's what I love about um, the song, Come Thou Fount. Uh, we didn't sing it today because I think we sang it the other week. But um, it, it says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And, and it's, I think it's another verse that we kind of just sing over, right? You don't really think about it. But prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I don't leave the God I love. Well, it points out the sinful condition of our heart. And it calls us back to him. Okay, we see in Philippians 2.13 that God works in us. It says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. If we want our desires to change, want our hearts to be constantly sanctified, made like Christ, we need to ask for this from God and sit under his word like we see David's prayer in Psalm 36. Brad Archer says it better than I could. When, when we do not spend time with God's word, our comprehension of the scope of Jesus' work is stunted. We are not given daily, fresh insights into how much we owe him, how great his gift is. Our love for him grows slowly and pitifully apart from daily nourishment at his scriptures, which remind us of our state without Jesus and with him. If you want your love of Jesus to be small, your comprehension of his grace to be insufficient, and your guilt for your sin to feel either heavy or non-existent, neglect the scriptures. And Psalm 119, 1 through 3, shows us how our pursuit of God should look. And where better to look than God's word itself? 
Psalm 119 says this, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who do no wrong, but walk in his ways. Our second point is this, we can see God's holiness more on a daily basis by walking in obedience daily. Obedience is meant to be practiced daily. So I'm a strength and conditioning coach. That's what I do for a profession. Um, So I work with athletes to get them stronger, more athletic, um, all those things. And I know, and you guys probably know, that if you don't exercise for a certain amount of time or you don't do a certain lift um, for a certain amount of time, right, if you've done it for a period of time, you might have been sore for a little bit, then you got better, but then you stop for like, let's say, three months of quarantine or something, and then you go back at it, what happens? You're really, really sore, okay? Can't walk right for about a week, um, and you're not very good at it. It's the same concept when it comes to obedience. If you don't practice it daily, you'll become poor with it. And when you do come back to it, a lot of things will not feel good for a while. And this kind of makes me think we, we can't treat Sunday morning like a buffet, okay? Or simply, you can't just work out that one time a week. It has to be practiced daily in order to work, okay? We have to eat meat on a daily basis. So an important question to ask is, what motivates you to follow Christ and do his will in your life? And then Paul answers this perfectly and says that the motivation is the love of God. We see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. And Paul demonstrates here that, that Christ's love controls. It, it compels us through his sacrifice. Since he has died for us, we have died to our old life and are compelled to walk in obedience. There's nothing we can do to separate ourselves from this kind of love, this exact kind of faithful, everlasting love we see in the second half of Psalm 36. And and wrapping it up here, Luke 14 uh, demonstrates one of the most radical points of obedience, and I'm probably not going to do this justice, okay? But Luke 14, 25 through 27, the cost of being a disciple. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And this friends, is the most paradoxical view in the gospel. In order to gain our life, we must lose it. This rewires everything that we see when it comes to obedience. Okay? And and, and you see this in the gospels when a large crowd is following Jesus. Jesus usually turns around and says something that makes the disciples go, where'd that come from? Okay? And he says this because he knew the reason a lot of the people following him They're following him for superficial reasons, shallow reasons, much like some of us today, just to gain something. And he wanted them to dig deeper or, like he said, just stop following me. Following Christ means total submission. And for some people, that even means means to death. There are some countries where people have to write down a verse on a piece of paper, memorize it, then eat that piece of paper. I've never, I've never had to do that. There are some people that, that die because of their obedience to Christ. But here's the good news, friends. We have been freed from sin. Instead of being slaves of sin, we are slaves of righteousness as a result of being born again. We have become obedient from the heart. The main point I'm going to leave you with and hopefully this, this, this is what you kind of remember out of all this. Uh, there's a lot of scripture there. I really want to stretch your attention span for the gospel. Um, but the main point is to have both a growing awareness of God's holiness, his ultimate plan of salvation from his son, Jesus Christ, and of our need for his, this salvation, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As David says in verse 10, he pours out his unfailing love on his people in the form of the blood of his son, 
Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for the opportunity and privilege to preach your word. Um, I pray today that uh, everybody saw not just me standing up here on a stage uh, reading from a book, but they saw the word of God um, living itself out. I pray that we would be able to gather together as one body again as you intended, but I thank you so much for the common grace you've given us in the form of our technology. Father, I pray for all those nations that uh, do not have, have the privileges that we do here to read your word. I pray for them. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm Bruce Hanke, an elder here at Onalaska Church of Christ. At OCC, we take communion every Sunday. And some people are probably surprised that we've continued to do so, even though we're no longer physically meeting together in this church building. Traditionally, we take communion on Sunday as part of our worship. But there's nothing magical about this day or this building or the emblems that we choose. Some people might believe that it doesn't really count if the bread is not unleavened and some will get caught up in whether or not the fruit of the vine is supposed to be fermented or not, if it's juice or if it's wine. I've heard people say that they don't want to take communion every Sunday because they don't want it to become routine. But I really don't think God's main concern is with the specific form of the bread or the juice that we use or where we are when we do it or how often we partake. God can be very specific when it really matters. If you don't think so, ask him how to build an ark or a tabernacle. The Bible simply tells us whenever we come together to eat this bread and to drink the fruit of the vine, to do so in remembrance of Jesus. The focus is on why we are eating this meal. God is more concerned with what's in our hearts and what's in our minds. We're called to examine our hearts for the unconfessed sin that separates us from God. And we're called to remember that, um, what these emblems represent, whether we're on our couch at home with a cracker or juice, or in a church building with bread and wine, whether you take communion as I finish speaking, while I'm praying, or later this afternoon. The bread in whatever form is meant to remind us that Jesus took the physical form of man on earth. And in that form, he experienced all the hardships, the difficulties, and the joys of being human, only to be eventually mocked, spat upon, whipped, and have that body broken and then nailed to the cross. And we drink the juice as a reminder that his blood was spilled on our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins. The bread and the juice are meant to remind us that Jesus suffered, died, and was buried and rose again because he loved us. It's to remind us that God so loved the world, each of us individually, that he gave his son as a sacrifice to redeem us so that we could have eternal life with him. If we truly take the time to recognize why Jesus' sacrifice was necessary, remember his broken body and the blood that was spilled on our behalf and the love and forgiveness it represents. I don't know how this time of communion, no matter where it takes place, could possibly be routine. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just praise you now and thank you for wanting to have a relationship with us. Jesus, I thank you for your willingness to be that perfect sacrifice that covers our sins and that allows us to accept you as our Savior and have eternal life with our Heavenly Father. As we go about the rest of our week, just fill us with your Holy Spirit. Remind us that as Christians, we represent you and give us the strength, the courage, and the love for others that we need to exemplify you in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Strangers' neighbors, our blood is. 
God's word. Children of generations of every nation of kingdom come. Don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes.
salvation is in his blood. Thank you, God. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Good morning and welcome to Onalaska Church of Christ. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Natalie. If this is your first time visiting with us, feel free to check out the New Here section on our website or fill out the contact form to connect with a pastor or staff member. Here's what's happening this week at OCC. We want to thank our church family for your continued generosity. If you are led to give, we now offer three ways that you can do so. Securely online at go to OCC.org. Text to give by texting the word give and your amount to 608 291 9514 and in person. Your generosity is what helps us achieve our mission of making more and better disciples. Our summer online growth groups are currently underway. We have three groups that are meeting throughout the week. Our sermon follow up meets on Monday evenings at 8 p.m and is led by Jonathan and Natalie Rodriguez. Our Bible Promises group meets on Thursday afternoons at 2 p.m. and is led by Pastor Craig. And our group on the book of Ephesians meets on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. and is led by Bruce Hankey. It's not too late to join a group. For more information about online growth groups, please contact the church office. Our Sunday morning service is now live online each week through multiple social media platforms. Tell your family, friends, and neighbors to check out our website, Facebook page, or YouTube channel if they don't already have a church home. Remember, if you're traveling over the summer, you can still worship with your church family wherever you go. If you need help assessing your online services, email the church office and a staff member can assist you. Christian Chapel Daycare is hiring. They are looking for a lead teacher, a floater, and an assistant director. These positions will be 30 to 40 hours per week. If you're interested in any of these positions, contact Emmy Dieters either by phone at 608-783-5722 or by email at christianchapeldaycare at gmail.com. Happy birthday this week to Jan Wayne and Reagan O'Reilly and a happy anniversary to Gary and Mitzi Henson. Have a fantastic week. To keep up to date with everything happening at OCC, you can follow us online through Facebook, Instagram, and our church website. You can also email the church to get added to our email chain if you aren't part of it already. That's it for your OCC weekly announcements. We'll see you next week. Music